Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the next webinar in our series on the subject of designing drainage storage structures. My name is Peter Coombs. We're still waiting for quite a few to come on board. There's some well over a thousand registered. Good. Okay, I'm going to make a start now. Um, so what I plan to do in the webinar today is to run through a brief introduction, maybe five minutes, set the scene on storage structures, and then run a, a demonstration live. And I'll go through a six-step systematic approach to draining storage, uh, designing drainage storage structures, and then putting them into a model and testing the model, and maybe refining that model if needs be. So the majority of the time, I'll be running the microdrainage software. Uh, if you're following with microdrainage for the first part, you'll be able to follow OK. Uh, a little bit later on, I'll open up a model that I've created, so you'll struggle to follow because you don't have that model on your machines at the minute. So, uh, But follow as, as far as you'd like. The challenges that we have in terms of design criteria, I'm really focusing on the no flooding. So what, what kind of volumes of storage do we need to put at the surface or under the ground to mitigate against flooding for more extreme rainfall events? And here we have the, the 1 in 30 year return period highlighted. Um, the, the actual target return period is immaterial in terms of once we've identified what that is, uh, we can design in accordance with your local requirements. Um, so it's not an issue, but I'm going to focus on the, the 1 in 30 because this is probably the most common one for the audience that we have registered um, for, for the webinar today. And what I intend to do is design, design a storage structure and provide what we call a free board. Um, so this is to limit the height of the water level to within 500 millimeters of the ground level so that we have the opportunity to control and think about surface water management for when we go beyond this design criteria. Um, in the background, you'll see I have some sort of lightly highlighted uh, colors here. We can look at modeling things for the 100 year, identify overland flood routes, and, and that's maybe one for a subsequent webinar um, sometime in the future. Um, with regard to controlling the discharges, <clears throat> typically we're not able to have a free discharge unless we're outfalling to the sea or something like that. And I know that we have quite a few people overseas that are actually doing that. Uh, but if you're landlocked and working on infill sites, for example, typically you'll have to limit the discharge off the site to the pre-development or greenfield discharge rates. And we have increasing advice that's been coming out um, through, in terms of the UK and, and England and Wales, the, the lasso standards here, um, and also the latest um, sets manual that came out last month. So I'll be making reference to these uh, as we go through the webinar. Do feel free to share your particular local standards uh, with me. You'll see my email address at the end, and we can always help you with, with your local requirements. So in terms of what we need to do, um, Within the UK, typically, we need to look at the volume that will be discharged off of our site and compare that to the volume that was being discharged off the greenfield development or the greenfield area. If we can reduce or match the greenfield runoff volume, and for this we're using a 100-year, six-hour event, if we can match that or reduce the volume, then we will be allowed to discharge at the one year, the 30 year, and the 100 year discharge rates post development. Now, if we fail to do that, and I'm now thinking of the soil conditions, if you're in very free draining soil and you can infiltrate into the ground, then you have a chance with this first criteria. However, if the volume that you discharge post development is greater than the greenfield volume, so if you're on a, on a clay soil, which is probably the most common soil type or an impermeable soil, high water table, granite, rocks, etc., um, then you will not be allowed to discharge at the 30 and the 100 year rates. You'll be limited to the Q bar figure, which is around about the 2.33 year return period. Then the extra volume that we're discharging, we need to control within the confines of the site. So with this additional volume, we, we term as long-term storage. And again, maybe for a future webinar, I can show how to, how to model those aspects as well. This water that's typically stored on the surface uh, is then released slowly back into the network 
at a rate of two liters per second per hectare. So we can show you that on a, a subsequent webinar. I'll post a question at the end and see if that's of interest to you. So in terms of the project that I'm going to share with you today, I've, I've set up a model. So this is, uh, I'll open this up in microdrainage live in a second. Uh, the drainage network's designed for the one in one year return period. And what we have to do is to drag and drop a, an attenuation structure. Now the site I'm saying is a, a clay soil, which is probably the most common that we have in, in the UK. The gross area of the site, which is what we need to, to use to calculate the greenfoot runoff volume and the discharge rates, is just over three hectares. The impermeable area is just, will, after we develop, will be just under two hectares. That's around about 60% of the overall um, curtilage of the site. I've got some rainfall characteristics, some soil characteristics, and we're in the Thames Valley region. So from this information, we can then calculate the greenfield discharge rate. And knowing that we're in clay, realize that we're going to limit the discharge offsite to the Q bar figure, which in this case will be 14.1 liters per second. <clears throat> what we plan to do is to put in a, a pond, uh, and this could be a wet pond, it could be a dry pond uh, that attenuates. Uh, it could even be a hard landscaped pond. So some of the objections, if you like, of putting in such items is the amount of space that they're taking up. But there are some really good examples that are coming across from Europe, and I'm thinking Scandinavia, where they put water at the center of their drainage designs, and they'll build in a lot, lot of hard landscapes and storage areas, which can fit in with any urbanized landscape itself. What we're trying to do is to help promote uh, the latest Suds Manual four pillars of not just treating the quantity of the water through attenuation, but also treating the quality of the water and also providing amenity and enhanced um, ecosystems, enhanced biodiversity, the four pillars that, that come out of the Suds Manual. What we want to do with the pond is we want to put in some kind of upstream treatment. Now that could be a four bay within the entry pipe um, comes into the pond area. We can build in a four bay uh, for that sort of final polish is what we're trying to provide with this type of structure. But you may even put in something like a hard engineered solution like a downstream defender or something like that, a, an interceptor. Um, you can put in a range of different me measures to fit them into the confines of your particular projects. And within the Suds Manual, uh, they are recommending that we use landscape architects as well. We need their expertise in terms of planting regimes, etc., and their experience of building such structures over a long period of time. So looking at the actual demonstration, and um, I'll go live with the software now, I'm trying to run through a logical six-step systematic approach. Initially, calculating what the Greenfield peak discharge rates will be. Um, Identifying the Q-bar figure, knowing that we're in clay, I can then identify the storage volume that, that's required under the ground. And I'll take that volume and I'll design a pond. And that pond will be designed within the source control module. This is within the um, fundamental suite, actually. Um, but we can, we can optimize that design by using the CASDEF module. And that's in the advanced bundle of microdrainage. What I then intend to do is take that optimized pond, integrate it into a model where we have the pipes and the manholes, etc. It could be swales and open channels running through the, the network, um, but we'll integrate into a fully integrated model, and then we can test it um, using the, the APT module, which is in the essentials bundle. So I've put the bundles down the side here so you can double check what bundle you're working with. And uh, at the end of the day, I plan to value engineer this. So look at making sure that everything works, no flooding for the 30 year return period. And then we can just ensure that we're, we're value engineering the actual cost of construction for this particular um, network. And this is all comprising of the accelerator pack. So if you needed to add in any particular modules like the, the APT module or the CASDEF module or the QOS module, then talk to the sales guys about the accelerator pack that uh, they can help you with. So without further ado, I'll move on to the live demonstration. First of all, if I show you the model live in, in network, in microdrainage, just to orientate you, um, it's a development just over three hectares gross area um, with all the impermeable areas added into the model. The catchment areas have been added into the pipe network. 
Um, we can say that there's just under two hectares of impermeable area. So that's, as I say, about 60% of the development will be impermeable surfaces. Um, the color behind is just giving you an idea of the topography, red being higher ground, blue being lower ground. So the, the natural runoff will run from the west of the site across to the east of the site, just to give you a feel for the, for the topography. A ground model is seated underneath the CAD drawing. So we have all the ground levels, the proposed ground levels, the proposed highway levels, etc. We can see the, the camber on the road identified, etc. So the ground model is incorporated in, in, in there as well. So the network has been produced. It's running from the west towards the east, outfalling in the south east corner of the site. But coming back up a couple of pipes, uh, all the action, if you like, is happening in terms of limiting the discharge rates with a flow control at manhole. S6. Um, I've already added in, by the way, a couple of flow controls, an online flow control to limit the discharge, and the um, emergency overflow control at half a meter below ground level. What I don't have in here is the storage structure. So if I click on the, the network drop down and pond tank storage structure, there's nothing in there at all at this minute in time. That's the structure that I intend to design with you in source control. And then I'll drag and drop it into the into the network here to produce an integrated model. So let me just um, pop across into source control. And in source control, um, I'm using the rural runoff calculator. And I've added in the gross area of the site. I've picked on the map. Um, the site's located in the Thames Valley region. This is down in, in Swindon. I clicked on the Swindon location and the annual average rainfall and soil characteristics have been pulled across the soil index, 0.45. This is clay. Uh, and then the region. And all I need to do now is hit calculate. And this is where my Q bar figure of 14.1 has come from. So we can see that we need to limit to the um, Q bar figure because we're in, in clay, assuming that the volume is not going to be less than the Greenfield runoff volume, which would be very difficult in a clay soil. After we've calculated the greenfield runoff rates, I'd make a note of this. That's kind of step one achieved. Step two is to look at the volume of storage that we would need under the ground. So if I click on the file drop down and the quick storage estimate, and for those that are following live, by the way, you could have clicked on file and gone for the rural runoff calculator. Now I plan to put in the characteristics of the runoff to then calculate the volume that we need to store under the ground to mitigate against flooding. And in this case, I, I, I'm choosing to use the 30 year return period. I'll go to the map button again, choose the location of the site. And then I add in the impermeable area of the site, which is 1.909, uh, just under the two hectares and my Q bar figure of 14.1. Uh, don't worry about the infiltration coefficient or the safety factors. This would be in a situation where we do have a free draining soil, but I know that we're in clay. So I just use the analyze function, and the program will come back and tell me that we need between 509 and 721 cubic meters of storage. Quite a range. Um, so the program, at this moment in time, it doesn't even know that I'm thinking about designing a pond. Um, it doesn't know the flow control that I plan to use, whether I'm planning to use an efficient one or a, a less efficient one, uh, and the shape and size of the structure. So uh, at this point in time, it's giving us the best case, worst case kind of scenarios. Typically, we, we take the average of the, this figure, and this is, let me look at it, around about 615 cubic meters of storage that I would need. So if I say OK to that, <clears throat> the programs then prompted me to set up the global variables to then design my storage structure. And the storage structure that I choose is not a pipe. It's going to be a tank or, or a pond. And we notice all the different types of structures that we can design within the software. Um, maybe at the next, the next webinar, by the way, I'll be um, handing over to my colleague, Lude Miller, and then I'll do another subsequent microdrainage webinar looking at um, maybe the flow through a structure like a bioretention area 
um, or a swale or something like that and in integrating that into a model. Uh, but I'm, again, I'll post the question at the end to see what you'd like, like us to um, share with you next time. Um, the outflow control, uh, what are the options here? Uh, probably the, the industry standard in, in the UK is um, the vortex type controls uh, because they're very efficient. So I'll, I'll choose a vortex control here. And the emergency overflow I'd like to put in is a weir. Very, very good at controlling water levels, but I would not use a weir as an outflow control if efficiency was my main, my main aim. Uh, connected up to the um, webinar here, the graphics are lo looking a little bit interesting. Um, but I'm going to run through step-by-step -step process helped by the program. This has prompted me for the rainfall data that I've already installed. So I'll say OK to that. Um, we now need to um, add in a time area diagram. I've already um, set one up. So from the network model, you can export a time area diagram. Uh, I've imported the time area diagram. You may find this a little bit hard to see on your screens, but the total contributing, it, contributing area is the 1.909 hectares. This is telling the program at what rate uh, the runoff from the impermeable areas uh, is entering into the storage structure. So the majority of the area impermeable area is coming in the first four minutes. If I say OK to that, um, we can now set up the characteristics of the storage structure itself. The um, cover level is 33.25. Don't need to worry too much about the, the numbers here, but I just need to put some figures in that match the model. The invert level is 31.75 meters. And now I can set up within, ah, there we are. Just, just adjusted the, um, the view for you. I can now set up the volume that's going to be stored under the ground. The structure itself, I want to have one meter deep, the storage structure, with a half a meter of freeboard. So from the ground level to the infert level, we have um, 1.5 meters from ground level to invert level. Um, if I just use a little aid here to set the side slopes, in the sets manual, we're recommending one in four side slopes. Let's say OK to that. And then in the first meter depth, the volume needs to be 615 cubic meters. Now, what if I made a mistake here? What if I, what if I forgot the volume or I didn't even carry out an estimate? How about if I put in um, something a, a lot lower, 315 rather than five, uh, 615? I'll say OK to that. And then I just want to add in a benching around the edge of the pond. So again, I can use my little tool to set a side slope for that a half a meter below the ground level and then a benching and then I've got a what I know to be an, an, an inadequate size pond at this minute in time. So I've, I know I've made a mistake in my inputs. Say OK to that. Um, I'll choose my vortex control um, for the most efficient setup. I'm going to go for the, the optimum and um, put in the invert level, which is 31. 0.575 to the invert level of the flow control, a little bit below the invert level of the storage structure, and the total design head, because my flow control chamber is a little bit deeper, 175 millimeters deeper than the invert level of my storage structure, I'm surcharging that flow control um, to limit the discharge to the 14.1 liters per second, which is, which is going to fail because I know that I've un undersized my pond but I've set up the flow control device based on my um, in intent. And I do want to minimize the upstream storage because that's the most cost. So the size of the uh, outflow control is 167 millimeters, which is going to be adopted, potentially adopted by uh, an approving authority. It's over the minimum of 100 millimeters. So that's, that's all good and okay. Final step is to put in the information about the emergency overflow control. So I'll put this in as a one meter wide. I'll probably take a trench along that sort of shelf level. I'll just rip out a trench and then divert the flow when we go beyond the 30 year return period and control surface water management type control to take that excess water and volume away from buildings and property. 
and put it into public open space or so, somewhere where we're not affecting uh, businesses or the community. The crest level of that flow control is a half a meter below the grain level, and that is that is set at 32.75. When I say OK to that, I can hit the green for go to analyze, and let's see what the results are. I click on save, and I'll call this um, peat pond, and it's pre optimized. So I haven't optimized it yet because I made a mistake. And the consequences of the mistake are shown in, in red. This, this red line is the worst case scenario. This is the highest water level uh, reached uh, based upon all the different storm durations that the program has analyzed with. So everything from 15 minutes to seven days summer profile and 15 minutes to seven days winter profile. When working overseas, just use a range of uh, rainfall hiatus graphs that we generate for the local area and test against the local rainfall. So it's, it's the same principle. Um, I have flood risk and looking at the figures, I wanted to ensure that the pond was one meter deep maximum. Uh, we've got over, gone over the meter by, by 99 mil, which means that we've gone over the one meter head. So we're failing the discharge of 14.1. We're running at 14.6 and we we have uh, water flowing over the overflow so there's 14.6 liters per second flowing out through the vortex control the uh, the hydro brake but we have 53.3 liters per second running a, along that ditch that one meter wide ditch the emergency overflow so you, you add those two figures together we're, we're actually controlling um, 67.9 liters per second and there's the volume that's going over the ditch. So the maximum volume within the structure uh, reached 408 cubic meters. And the average for the, for the um, estimate was 615. So I'm, I'm kind of woefully short there. Now, I could go back and reset the volume. Or I could click on the drop down here and use CASDEF to fix it. What does CASDEF need to do? It needs to optimize the water level to no higher than half a meter below ground level. That's 32.750, not 32.849. We're 99 mil too high. So if I go to the edit option and click on the CASDEF controller, just check that we've got the, the right water level set at 32.75. So this is half a meter below the ground level. Say OK to that. And then we can click on the drop down and get CASDEF to fix my problem. If I say save to that, now we can see that the water level has reached uh, 998 millimeters. It's the, the optimum size of the pond, which is actually not 615, but 517 cubic meters. So we've, we've chosen well with our flow control. Um, the range ran from 509 up to 721. So we're at the very, very uh, low end of that estimate. So that's an optimum design in my mind. I could take a look at the graph view and we can see the inflow hydrograph at the top is the blue line and the outflow hydrograph where we're, we're rising up to the 14.1 and then discharging at 14.1 is the red line. So we've we've set up a an efficient um, system here, and these are the these are the results. And just to double check, we're we're not running over the fourteen point one liters per second. So I I know that I can confidently put this into my model, and it it should work, assuming we put the storage structure in the right place, and the rest of the network is working okay. So. This is going to be an interesting exercise to complete now. So moving over into network in the micro drainage, um, we can click on the toolbox. <clears throat> and all I need to do is add in the structure. So if I click on the structures drop down, let's drag and drop our pond onto manhole S6. We just need to check the uh, Input levels and the cover levels. 
as I drag and drop that in. 31, and that will be 31.750, which is 1.5 meters below ground level when I import my, um, well, Pete's Pond pre-optimized, I, I, I saved again. So it is actually the optimized pond. If I grab that, there's my optimized pond that's been brought in. And there's the 519 cubic meters where my mouse is. You'll see the 519 cubic meters in the one meter deep storage structure. If I say OK to that, we can now test our system. So this is the, the fully integrated network. Uh, I dragged and, and dropped from here, by the way. I, I just dragged and, and dropped the hydro brake, and I dragged and dropped the weir overflow control onto the same node. So everything's happening at the same place. And what I can do now is go to the site criteria and look at the simulation that we need to run for not the one-year return period that we designed for, but the 30-year return period. And at this minute in time, um, in, in source control, it identified a 240-minute uh, winter profile event being critical for the pond. Uh, we would need to run all the different all the different storm durations. So be careful not to just take what's in the simulation criteria. This one's defaulting to the 30 minute summer storm and then analyze this. And if we get good results, think that we've solved the problem. <clears throat> I've just hit, um, I've just hit the analyze button and we've now got some results. If I turn all my flags on, there are a range of um, colors. We've got blue on a white background, and we have red on a white background, and four different types of status. It's either OK, where the flow is still uh, running at less than the capacity of the pipe, less than one, uh, where the blue text is. We've got less than 100% of the capacity of the pipe being utilized. And the OK status means that we're flowing within the pipe. We have a, a negative surcharge depth below the soffit level. In other words, the water is still within the pipe. I can switch off the OK pipe, which is the outfall pipe, downstream of the flow control, uh, and then move up to the surcharged um, pipes. So we have surcharge is another warning. Blue on a white background, so the, the pipe itself is OK, but there's something happening at that location. In other words, this is where I put the flow control. So we're, we're surcharging in the manhole, because I've added the flow control. It's not being restricted by the pipe size itself. Uh, and then upstream of, of the surcharge pipe, and there are a couple of the surcharge pipes upstream as well, uh, we have flood risk and flood. So flood risk, we're getting close to the ground level. If I look at the file dropdown and the preferences, we have a flood risk warning of 500 millimeters. So we can say OK to that and uh, switch off our flood risk. And there are four four pipes flooding, or four manholes flooding within the network for this one event. So this is the danger. We, we fix the flooding, we look at the flooded volume, and then add that in at these locations, and then think that we've resolved everything. That's not necessarily the case. We, we need to do a thorough test. And to do that, I'm going to use the APT wizards, uh, comprising of the seasonal return period wizard. And I'll just focus upon the 30-year return period. Uh, just choose my map button. Make sure I'm using the right rainfall criteria. Move on to next. Make sure that we're checking all the storm durations. Next. Check the return periods. Add in for climate change if you wish to. I want to just focus on fixing this for the 30-year no flood criteria. And we say next and finish. This won't fix anything. It's just going to identify if there are any problems where they are. So if you're an approving authority, or if you want to just check before you submit to the approving authority, these are the useful wizards that can save you hours upon hours of time. I'll click on Save. And I will now click on the little warning triangle at the top of the screen here, which will then sort out all of the critical storms throughout the network. It's identifying the top water level at each node, at each manhole, and telling me what the worst case is for each location within the network. Where the flooding is occurring, 
it is it is the 15 minute event so away from manholt uh, s6 where my pond is so the pond's working but i'm getting flooding and it's not it's not massive amounts we're getting sort of three eight seven five one seven just over seven cubic meters of flooding at each of these locations how do we how do we fix this um got a, a few options really um we could go back to the uh, network design criteria and we could say to the program okay i'm going to use a higher return period to design my flow conveyance i could go from a one year to a two year return period increase the max rainfall so i'm not capping the rainfall and then let the program upsize the pipes that, that are acting as throttle pipes is one option um, the other two options would be to upsize the manholes so i could add additional chamber ring diameter to to these locations to to add some sort of online storage as a larger manhole uh, and act as attenuation it's another option third option would be to upsize the pipes themselves now i'm just looking at the pipe numbers so it's two three zero zero one one zero zero two four four zero zero one and one zero zero three how about we upsize the individual pipes because we know this is the location of the the flooding um i'll i'll use cast f to do that so rather than uh, spend the next half an hour going through different iterations um, what we'll do is we'll use cast f and get cast f to fix it for us so if i click on the site drop down and identify the parameters that we want cast f to work towards so we want cast f to use all of the storm durations 15 minute all the way up to seven days okay and everything in between uh, we want to put in a freeboard uh, and under the ground and we want to uh, increase the pipe sizes incrementally 75 mil step increments up to a 1500 diameter and then 150 increments above the 150 diameter i could in increase the, the freeboard if I, I wanted to um, and then using the network drop down we can use casdef controller to then upsize the pipes that need to be modified so this is pipe 1001 it's manhole 2 it is manhole 5 and it is manhole s489 s5 and that should do the job for us i don't need to use casdef on the other other aspects so i'm just going to switch it off there okay so i just double check that i've set the the right criteria up which looks okay to me say okay so i've set up casdef saying right upsize those identified pipes that are undersized and now if i run the wizard i can run casdef and the summary wizard and if we run through with checking with summer and winter profile events want to use all the storm durations and i want to use a fine step increment so we'll let cast f go off upsize those pipes and then we'll see what the the final net effect is at the uh, at the end, end of the day we'll end up with a, an audit trail that's been provided for us and at the end of this i'd like to look at the cost of constructing this because I've added in a flow control at the downstream end, uh, assuming this works okay, um, what I want to do is look at the pipes downstream of that flow control. It's a 167 millimeter diameter uh, hydro brake, so we don't need anything larger than a 225 diameter pipe. So if I save the information, and again I hit on the um, critical storm. The screen looks blank because there is no flooding. I've got a f display flooded pipes flag um, ticked on, and there are no flooded pipes. So CASDEF has fixed it. Uh, what has it done? Well, if we look at the results and we look at the CASDEF audit trail, 
it's taken the criteria that I set up and it's upsized okay the pipes that I asked it to upsize so you have a range of different pipe sizes this you won't have realized but actually this has just gone up like one pipe size in each of the locations now if the pipe size increases and uh, this means that you need to match that with your manhole chamber ring to make sure you have an appropriate size chamber so it's upsized the um, pipe and it's upsized the chamber in accordance with the standards that you've set in the design criteria so we fix the problem in a in a, a matter of minutes and we have just one area of flood risk towards the upstream end of the site we have uh, a range of surcharge pipes because we have a, a flow control to limit the discharge we were aiming at 14.1 liters per second so within the fully integrated network we're discharging at a worst case of 14.0 so we're, we're we're complying with the greenfield discharge rate and then downstream of those uh, of, of the flow control and the storage structure uh, we can see that we have a a couple of pipes what size are they um, and can we downsize them is, is what I'm thinking um, before I do that I'd like to look at the cost of constructing this without the value engineering so let, let's take a look at the results and I'm going to use cost now to price up the job carry out the full taking off if I click on the button now the takeoff data option it's instantly um, taken off but it's saying oh we've got 12 pipes that have not been fully classified what we can do is we can set up um, a range of classifications for pipe materials thicknesses the construction of everything associated with the project and what I'll do is I'll go to the network and I'll choose the network classifications to select which pricing model I want to use Am I estimating at this minute in time, or am I a contractor building this? So am I using build costs or estimation costs? You could set up a range of different uh, options here. And if I click on classifications, I can load in a file using my mates rates. So if I choose my mates rates, you can see here that I've got um, a range of pipes. I've, I've set up 417 options concrete pipes, clay pipes, ductile iron, you name it, they're in there. Manholes, brick manholes, reinforced concrete, different shapes and sizes, different depths, etc. Um, we can put in depth ranges in terms of excavation costs, miscellaneous items, blinding concrete, um, bulking factors, etc., etc. And prices for storage structures, prices for flow controls, they're all in there. So I'll say okay to that. By saying okay, everything's now been classified. So we've got clayware pipes. Um, you could you could re reclassify them as concrete if you wanted to. But now, what I'd like to do is have a look at the um, the price. So if I look at the price, which is underneath, I can expand the tree. This this has taken a second for the program to carry out all the taking off for my pipes, my manholes, everything all the materials, all the grain works, it's all priced up. And if I look at the overall costs, you can see that we're looking at um, 209,466 pens and 44p. And that's to, to construct the manholes, the pipes, all the associated materials, the grain works, flow controls, and the storage structures. How about if I look at those last two pipes downstream of the flow control? So if I look at the network, so remember the 209,000. So I could lock down my project and say, I'm not going to design anymore. I'm just going to effectively create a model and downsize the final pipe or, or pipes. I'm going to make it existing. And I will now go to the network. The existing network details and I don't necessarily need a 375 millimeter diameter pipe to control the flow to 14.1 liters per second 
I need that to feed into the storage structure, you know, coming down from the upstream end. But downstream of the hydro break, which is the 167 mil opening size, I can afford to um, downsize the pipe to, let's go for a 225 for pipe 1004 and for pipe 1005. And if I enter those, I could rerun the analysis, but uh, if I look at the cost implication and look at the taking off details, the cost has now dropped to 203,000. So I've just saved 6,000 pounds, sort of 3% th of the cost of the, of, of, of the pipes. And we can rerun the analysis and that will then confirm that our uh, network is, is working okay. So job done and value engineered. What I'll do now is I'll just return to my slide presentation and I hope, I know it's a little bit of a whistle stop tour, um, but, but I hope I managed to save your lunch hours by using uh, uh, CanStaff in there to optimize the system and running through this systematic approach of identifying what my greenfield runoff rates are, carry out a storage estimate to understand the volume that I need under the ground, I could then optimize the pond using CASDEF uh, within source control itself. Um, I can then add that into the integrated model to create the fully integrated model. And then, and then we test it, find out where the problems are, and then we can use CASDEF to fix the problems and value engineer. And that's really what it's, it's all about. So that enhances your, your speed and your productivity. You can be confident that because you're identifying the exact locations where the flooding is occurring, you can be confident that you're fixing all the problems. So just to open things up for you guys, feel free to feedback through the survey. I would actively encourage you to complete the survey at the end of this uh, and let us know what you'd like to see in a future webinar. I'll be doing a webinar with Ludmilla um, looking at some modeling and, uh, and flooding and then following on from that, based on your feedback, I'll run a, a micro drainage webinar and I'm thinking at the minute how else we could enhance our models. So we could, we could start looking at the effect of modeling the flow of the water um, through, through a structure. So I could show you how to design something like a bioretention area with uh, different layers of filter media beneath the open storage structure um, and how that would help to reduce the peak runoff as well uh, and, and add that into a, a fully integrated model. Just sharing ideas with you here now, folks. Um, the other option is uh, also to look at the uh, extreme um, over overland flooding where we go way beyond the design and then test for the, the 100 year or the 200 year, 1000 year, whatever your requirements are, and look at managing that exceedance and protecting property and people. Uh, and also, Something that's coming up increasingly is looking at that uh, long-term storage that I alluded to earlier on, where you have to look at the the excess volume that's being run off the site potentially and put that into long-term storage and control that within the confines of the site. So these are just kind of ideas that I'm thinking that you may wish to, to have me cover. Um, but do feel free, as I say, to drop me a line or, or let us know through the survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, looking ahead to next month, uh, we have some, some training coming up on the 22nd to 25th of February. This is micro drainage uh, training. And then 8th to the 10th of March, we have three days of XP swim training on the, on the modeling and flood risk mapping. Uh, the next webinar, I've highlighted this in red. We normally run on a Wednesday lunchtime at midday. We're moving forward a day to Tuesday, the 22nd of March. And so just to be a little bit careful in case we've got you into a, a habit. We're changing the habit for this one. Uh, meanwhile, have yourselves a great time, and I really appreciate your participation in this presentation on designing drainage storage structures by myself, Peter Coombs. Have a great day, folks, and take care.